Good afternoon, everyone. I am Srinija from A Club Bangalore. I'm the vice president. Uh, let's begin the session with introducing the speakers first. So first on the list, I have uh, Mr. Venkat Rao. I will just quickly introduce all of you. So Mr. Venkat Rao is the vice president and country head, sending technology solutions, India and ASEAN at Pitney Bowes. He's responsible for driving the in India Centech operations as well as ASEAN sales. Mr. Rao is board director of Pitney Bowes India and has more than 20 years of experience in general management, PNL strategies, and thought leadership. He combines strategic insights with expertise in consumer, telecom, and technology industries to capitalize on new business opportunities. As Geetam and Stanford alumnus, Mr. Rao is an active contributor as a speaker and participant in industry conversations. Welcome, sir. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Next on the panelists list, we have uh, Mr. Subrat Bharal. Mr. Subrat Bharal has 14 years of professional experience in incubating and accelerating new and unconventional businesses for his organization, Tata Steel Limited. He is currently responsible for setting up technology-led product and consulting businesses and established Tata Steel's flagship startup alliance program. A steel slag-based agricultural soil conditioner under the brand name of Ruby Gold and a technical consulting venture called PSIC and are examples of new ventures which have been recently commercialized by the Alliance and Ventures team of Tata Steel under him. Welcome, sir. Next on the list, we have Mr. Gre Gregory Collier. Professor Gregory Collier comes from an extensive leadership background to services, start up with techn a strong technology foundation or to energize services organization interested in expanding globally. He has over 25 years of experience in a senior leadership and management experience with IT and BPO background. He has successfully handled large teams both in the US and Asia. Professor Collier finished his bachelor's degree from Purdue University and management degrees from Eastern Michigan University and Thunderbird University. He's been associated with New C as the director of international programs. He's also a professor of, professor of practice and entrepreneurship and innovation at Demond uh, McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Next on the list, we have Mr. Krish Nangi Kadda. Mr. Krish Nangi Kadda is a seasoned business leader, angel investor, and entrepreneurship evangelist. A big picture executive with a keen eye for operational detail and penchant for execution excellence. He has a proven track record in business strategy, startups, bootstrapping, team building, and growth. He has an extensive experience in business reorganizations, M&A, and strategic planning. Mr. Krish is also the Chief Innovation Officer at Geetam Deem to the University. He's also the Advisory Board Member to the IDEA Program at Northeastern University. Welcome, sir. So let's start with the panel. So my qu first question would be to Mr. Krish. So we often hear people saying that we should follow our dreams and build something meaningful. Now, when it comes to your profile, uh, you know, you've been to L you've been to JNTU. After that, you worked with LNT for three years. And then you started Unix Infotech. After that, you've been to Northeastern's business school for an MBA. And you were back into the fray with uh, unique computing solutions. So it's a long profile and you know, it's a remarkable growth trajectory. That's what I could say. So I just want to ask you, so what keeps you driving to be an entrepreneur and be an entrepreneurship evangelist? Thank you, Vishal, uh, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, 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 I hope everyone is uh, safe uh, uh, your, your, yourself your family friends uh, around you are, are safe wherever you are uh, things are really bad in india i uh, urge all of you to take extra precautions uh, to be uh, vigilant and uh, 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 and let this uh, let this pass uh, uh, all, all the best to all of you uh, to your question uh, vishal uh, Yes, uh, I've had a uh, formal education like uh, most uh, people in the audience. Uh, I'm a trained engineer, uh, uh, joined a great corporation right uh, out, of, uh, out of college, uh, uh, then worked for uh, several years. Uh, um, uh, then f as I started working, uh, no, I I'm a keen observer of uh, things then. Uh, this is, uh, I, to set the context, this was uh, in the early 80s. Uh, uh, so if you're good, you would get a great job. Uh, 
If you're not good, uh, then you probably would work for a private company. Uh, or if you're not even to that level, then you would probably uh, start a business. So starting a business was uh, the lowest priority for any, any student uh, back then. Um, and I come from a background uh, where uh, my, my father was a professor and uh, my uncles were uh, teachers. So this is, it's a normal uh, family where, you know, you, you are trained uh, to be uh, good in uh, studies, get great grades and uh, always do well uh, and get a great job. That's how uh, you know, you, you, you're, uh, you've been groomed. Um, so from that, uh, it, it was not easy for me to step out of the comfort zone uh, and uh, start thinking about something uh, you know, to do on my own. But this thought always uh, uh, was um, uh, in my mind um, uh, that I needed to be independent. I needed to uh, do something different. Uh, uh, and as I observed things around me, as I went about my job, uh, uh, the IT industry was just about opening up in the uh, early 80s in India. Uh, IBM uh, PCs were coming in, um, uh, the computer PC revolution was uh, uh, taking in. This was, I'm talking about 82, 83 time frame. Uh, so that provided an opportunity for me as I hailed uh, from a rural area. Uh, I hailed uh, from uh, a village. Uh, I have grown up in uh, small towns. Uh, I've seen that whatever computers were doing for uh, the larger corporations uh, with the PC coming in, uh, they could be adopted for smaller businesses in uh, smaller towns and villages. Uh, that ignited a thought in me that, you know, this is something I should uh, embrace and go after. And uh, I went after that and it was uh, not a very encouraging uh, environment. Uh, uh, everyone said, you know, why, why are you leaving such a great job? That was a dream job. Uh, this company that I worked for last and Tubro only hired 100 engineers a, a year. And I was fortunate to be one of them. Uh, There's uh, on a national basis. I was fortunate to be one of them. And uh, LNT in those days was uh, engin an engineer's dream job. Uh, and I, I wanted to quit. Uh, and uh, everyone said, are you crazy? Uh, why, why do you want to do this? Uh, but then I decided I wanted to quit. And I went on to uh, start my uh, entrepreneurial career. Uh, uh, and and uh, there was no looking back. I've enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, you get to do uh, things that you get to solve problems, you get to uh, interact with people. Uh, you, you should realize uh, uh, entrepreneurs solve problems and I love solving uh, problems. Uh, so I hope that answers your, your question, Vishal. Yes, sir. Just as an extension to the same question, I would also want uh, Professor Collier to answer the same thing. Uh, since you've been associated with uh, Indian universities uh, like Geetham and all that, I just want to ask you this. What are some of the distinct differences in thought process of student entrepreneurs you have seen in India and the USA? Great, uh, thank you, Vishal. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting journey to, to watch. And, 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 by, and by the way, uh, I also do hope and wish everyone well in India. You know, the problems are, are covering the world and we, we have students from every walk of life in uh, at, at Northeastern University and, and uh, I know it's, I think one of the most difficult challenges right now is the separation. We have students from India and from China and from all over. And uh, uh, I do have a student whose father uh, is in India who is very sick right now. And so uh, he's, he's struggling deeply. And, and so when you put that on top of trying to study, uh, you know, we have to be very flexible and empathetic with our, with our students and our, our courses. So I hope everyone is taking care of themselves, please. Um, yeah, so it's been interesting traveling around. The, the, I don't know if there's a significant difference between the way Indian students and American students or the students at Northeastern, whom are, are from all walks of life, uh, actually think. But I will say that it's the backgrounds that they have that make more of a difference. Uh, I've seen, uh, we, we have worked uh, closely with uh, universities in India and colleges in India that are supporting some of the, the rural communities and uh, the students in those communities really face uh, a different set of issues. And, and so the, the projects that they come up with and the businesses that they want to start are really dealing with those kinds of issues that they're exposed to, um, whether it's 
uh, aqua farming or uh, other kinds of sustainability issues, those are on the top of their mind. When you're in an urban setting, like uh, Visekhapatnam or, or even here in Boston, uh, the exposure is a little bit different. And so you'll see, you'll see uh, the students thinking about problems that they're exposed to. And I think this is the important thing is when you're starting a business, the students need to think about those arenas that they're A, passionate about, but B, also have a little bit of domain knowledge or information about. You can't start a company and not know something about the business, the problem you're trying to solve, uh, or at least have a team that can do that. So I'd say it's not so much where you live in terms of which country, but it's the environments that you're, you're exposed to that give you uh, a set of domain knowledge that's important for you to, to try and solve problems that you're familiar with. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Nangega, could you give your views on the same thing? Well, I uh, absolutely uh, second what uh, uh, Greg uh, just said. Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, again, going linking back to my previous answer, uh, entrepreneurs solve problems. Uh, and India uh, is big on problems. Uh, uh, we have huge population. We have uh, huge poverty levels, uh, uh, lack of access to basic amenities. Uh, uh, there's so many, so many problems around us. Uh, 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 and that is uh, 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 a dream scenario for an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's ironic uh, that we have problems, but entrepreneurs are, are problem solvers. So as uh, uh, you go about uh, your surroundings, uh, you, know, you, you watch things around, you, you, you take a walk, you, you, you live your normal day, uh, you see, you encounter so many problems. Entrepreneurs see opportunities in those problems. How can I solve this problem? Uh, at the end of the day, whether you're doing it for profit or uh, uh, not for profit, uh, it, it is a, a solution to a, a problem. Simply put, that is what entrepreneurs uh, do. So opportunities are abound. Uh, uh, if you grow up in an urban setting with little exposure to uh, the surroundings and little exposure to day-to-day -day problems that uh, you know, the masses uh, face, uh, a normal uh, uh, consumer faces, then you are not very likely to come up with you know, a solution uh, for that. But if you live that problem on a daily basis, uh, uh, it's, it's very, very likely that uh, if you've developed an analytical and observant uh, mind, you, you would hit upon a, a solution uh, for that. So the distinction we have seen, you know, uh, I've seen ventures uh, uh, in the Boston incubator uh, you know, today, uh, uh, the IDEA uh, incubator in, in, in Boston has uh, nearly 500 uh, ventures. Uh, uh, so we, we go through these ventures, we, we review them, we, we look at them. They, they, they're great ventures, uh, but I've also seen uh, for the past uh, uh, three plus years I've spent in India, uh, I've also seen uh, the venture ideas that come from students uh, of India. Uh, there's a huge difference between, uh, uh, in fact, it was a, you know, it's a, it's a big uh, uh, wake up call for us when we saw this about three years ago, the kind of ideas that students from uh, India are, are coming up with. There's always a social engineering aspect of it to the business problems that uh, the Indian students uh, wanted to solve. Uh, uh, especially I'm talking about students coming from rural areas uh, uh, with very little exposure to, uh, you know, the urban way of uh, living. So they come up with problems that they have around themselves in their family. They have seen things uh, happen uh, 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 and they want to solve that problem. Uh, and uh, in the ventures that we see um, uh, back home here in uh, Boston, uh, it's more, more, uh, uh, making a profit or, you know, how can we uh, definitely solve a problem, but no focus has been more in making a profit. So we see a big difference just between India and uh, the United States. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is for Professor Collier. Uh, sir, this is an interesting question. The thing is, uh, it's more relevant since you're an academician. So I just want to ask you this, you know, there are stories of entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, even Ritesh Agarwal and Nikhil Kamath from India, who have dropped out of uh, their college or their high school and pursued this dream of entrepreneurship. And there is some glamour that is associated with it. So what's your take on this, being an ac academician? 
A uh, really good question. Um, there's glamour associated the companies that you hear about that are successful, right? And those are those are, are a rare a rare breed, and we can celebrate those for sure. We we sometimes ignore the hundreds, if not thousands, of ventures that didn't quite make uh, make the grade. And so uh, we have to be a little bit careful about how much we uh, praise uh, some of these uh, types of uh, uh, you know ventures, but. I think one of the things that we have to realize is that education, academics, higher education is changing. And, you know, in, in the days when, as Krish was mentioning, in, in my day, uh, you had to drop out of college in order to start a venture because the university systems weren't supporting and didn't provide the kind of environment that you needed to explore your ideas. And uh, just as a really interesting example, the difference between Boston and, uh, or the US and, and in India, in the US, a student, a, a university student on average changes their degree, what they want to focus on three to four times. And I know in India, it's still pretty rigid. I think if you start a degree, that's what you finish. And that flexibility we have learned is really important in incentivizing students to focus in on and learn what they need to do in order to, in this case, start a business. And so we think, and, and with programs uh, like this that we're, we're bringing into GITAM, the more exposure we can give students to things outside of their normal course uh, that gives them a chance to test and experiment uh, is very critical in starting your own business. So I think, you know, there's no correct path. Uh, some students know what they want to do. Uh, they have a strong solution. They can build the team. Maybe they have access to capital or, or uh, skills that allow them to do that. And there's no there's no wrong answer. You can go and start your company. And uh, but I think I think that's a relatively rare breed. And so universities owe it to the students to provide flexibility that gives them the chance to experiment while continuing to pursue a focus on some area that uh, they can get some additional skills uh, before launching. So yeah, it's not an either or, there's not one path, but I think universities owe it to the students to bring that flexibility into the environment. Yes, sir. So just as an extension of the same question, uh, I'm Michelle, sure you're right. Michelle, yes. I'll just uh, take up the next question here. Yeah, thanks for that. So I'll point the next question to uh, Mr. Venkat Rao. So, uh, Mr. Rao, based on your in experience in the industry, uh, what we'd like to uh, see is two things. One question was that, how, what do you think is the scope of not so conventional? So like uh, Mr. Krish pointed out that, yeah, IT is one of the sectors which was easy for that to gain traction. Uh, and so it was an ideal candidate, good fit for the startup industry. But if we are, they are talking of not like so like uh, tuned sectors, for example, let's say medical sector, right? So you know that Geetam has a medical college. We have some very good doctors who have a very strong entrepreneurial mindset. In fact, one of the doctors is right now attending the session. He has posted a very interesting question here. He is asking that point blank, point blank question is, what is the scope for the medical industry, startups in the medical industry? That's one question. Second question was that you have spent a lot of time in the, in the industry, in the corporate sector. So as an employee of a company, how difficult or how easy is it to be on your entrepreneurial journey. So these are the two questions I would like to ask you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. And uh, firstly, a big thanks for uh, you know making me part of this. I think it's really an honor. I think I think somebody asked in the panelist a question that what is this session about? I think let me put it in one line. It's more about storytelling. And I think I personally have heard a couple of stories from uh, Krish. I think that's that's pretty fascinating. Imagine the early 80s when nobody would even able to venture into it, somebody embracing, and that's, I, I don't think it can be any better entrepreneurship story than what we are hearing. So coming back straight to your uh, question, Ashuto, so is there any scope for other things? I think uh, very apt the topic has come on medical. I don't think there could be any other time than now for a medical entrepreneur. I mean, Chris, Chris has mentioned this ironically. Look, you have problems, you have opportunities, and you have this, and that's clearly visible. I don't think you would be, I mean, there are many problems in the medical domain now if somebody really want to uh, look at it. And just to give an example, I think I just, I just saw it in a news channel yesterday that from Tejas fighter jet, uh, the government is planning to produce oxygen. And I believe the Tejas fighter jet has got an ability to produce one metric ton of oxygen per hour or something from atmospheric aid. 
So, I mean, and, and uh, it has also come that I think one of the state governments in North India, UP, is planning to pick up three or four of those O2 kind of engines and produce oxygen uh, at that particular level. And uh, I think there have been examples when you look outside. I think I think it it might sound like a repetition, but these are some of the things which are very very uh, you know common basic things when somebody wants to embark on an entrepreneurial journey. I think observe. There's nothing bigger than observing the problems and observing the needs and the wants around you. I think the enough stories on the medical thing, especially, is around you have the practice and you have. Let, let's look at this. I think I, I think most of the people uh, who took the home isolation package during virtual thing has been a completely different domain altogether, which even forced some of the homegrown medical companies to build an app and then you know, ensure that the doctor is coming over there and everybody basically sits in that stuff. So to sum it up, I think there is enough scope for entrepreneurship and, and I don't think the tech, the tech piece is yes, I think that's, and honestly, let's, be, let's also agree to the fact what uh, Professor has mentioned. We do not change our domains. We do not change our thinking navigation part uh, to a great extent during when we procure our university degrees. There are compelling reasons for that. Let's understand we are a, we are a humongously popula uh, populated country and then uh, it's more like a rat race and we are pretty competitive and somebody has to prove. So people typically look for the safer zones where things are more easier. But having said that, I think there is this opportunity if one is able to look beyond the tangent and look, be creative in his own ways and across all the domains and need not be held. It can be, I think the example is I was, uh, uh, she was reading the profile of uh, one of our panelists here and he says that STIC, uh, that's, that's an amazing innovation. That's an innovation of soil and steel. I mean, just, just look at it. I mean, what kind of domain and completely all beat in a different kind of domain as such. So it exists everywhere and I'll pause here. And sorry for that. You've got to ask me the second question again. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. So my second question was basically that for corporates, right? As we are, if you're an employee of a company, many of yeah, the audience sorry. here are right now students, right? So students might not, jump in directly, maybe they plan to do uh, their own startup in a few years time. So do, do you think like the corporate sector right now is having the, the right uh, like mindset and they're, they're in, like uh, motivating the people to take up entrepreneurship? What's your view on that? Uh, before even telling that uh, whether the organizations are giving the motivation or not, I would say that this starts with the individual itself. I think let's understand uh, entrepreneurship is more of a mindset. It does start with self. How much ever induced kind of priorities being injected to somebody, I don't think it could happen. Again, I'm going back to what Krish said. I think imagine in those days when a job like LNT is considered to be a blue chip and somebody is able to think about it, leave it and move away. I don't think there is a great role of an organization to push him for that. It's more to come from within, come from uh, the respective individuals. But having said that, uh, let me also tell you the corporate world is not any different. Uh, if if one is able to wear an entrepreneurial mindset, you will be successful enough as anywhere. And the biggest, uh, to be very honest, the corporate world, I mean, for all the folks who want to embrace a job in the initial phase of the lab, I would tell you uh, the ability to take risks are far higher if there's a conducive environment. Because it's an organization, you want things are not at stake. But having said that, you will be responsible and playing pretty high with respect to stakes and taking calls. And, and uh, if I were to sum it up in long, one line, I think uh, the advantage of failing fast is far more higher in a corporate environment than in, in your own entrepreneurial stuff. Because you bring a lot of things to table when you, when you do your own entity and a lot of money, a lot of other things and various stuff. Imagine in a corporate world, I'll just give you my example. I, I embarked onto a company called Philips India immediately from Geetham. This was in lighting. It was a very traditional FMCG kind of business. People who understand FMCG will know it like levers. There's a big plan. The van goes, it gives stocks, and then does all the stuff. And I was bogged up in six months. And that was when Philips launched something called as a compact fluorescence lamp was brought in. I mean, it's a bit of stories of which I'm trying to tell this. Uh, compact fluorescence lamp, which was 10x of the price of a normal bulb. So people said, this is crap. Who's going to buy this 300 rupees when a bulb is available for less than six rupees or so? And the trade was just against it. They said, I mean, you're a fool. You're coming with something. It's not going to sell. Get out of from here. And you know, the route which I took, I think, thanks to the then chief minister there, who was Mr. Naidu, he had run a program called as self-help group Dwakra Women. And this, again, I'm taking back to what uh, Krish said. So I thought, I mean, I was lucky enough to get a call from one of the collector, Debrat Kanta, those days. He said, look, I want to advocate about energy saving. And Philips is the best company. I would want you to come and talk something about it. 
Uh, we went there. I went there just to give a talk, and it's tempo of let's say five minutes. And what I have as an audience, let's understand the audience I have is not an August panelist who's sitting over here. I have an audience of 350 women whose highest qualification was fourth grade. Bad it is fourth grade was the highest qualification. But what do they have is a self belief that they're going to advocate something around energy saving and all. Then, I mean, I just threw this idea with the district collector. Then I said, why can't I make them use as a sales channel, as an alternative sales channel? He said, fine, but they're not going to pay you anything. So you have to trust them and give some land. They will go door to door and sell it. And mind you, we did this project in a district called Karim Nagar. And to me, to me personally, it's so close because it was after a particular time, it was not about targets. It was like uh, the, the mission became so big. I mean, Philips India sold the Asia Pacific target in one district called Karim Nagar. I'm talking about early 2000s. Okay, and, and it became so big that the Philips Worldwide President John Weibro came in and he addressed women of around some 350 women and some of the women went on the dais and said that Look, this company gave me a chance to basically send my school for computer, a kid for computer education. It's not about the lamp and all that. And that's a social engineering kind of thing. And, and what helped me honestly is nothing but an entrepreneurial mindset and all. And, that, and then on, I never stopped thinking in that direction. So if one has to think in an entrepreneurial thing, do not restrict that even, I would even say, you don't even need to have an MBA if you really want to think in an entrepreneurial mindset. I think it starts there. Then at some point, there are enough courses, as you know, Professor was saying, like, there are many entrepreneurs, you know, whom I am mentoring now in the Stanford Lead Mentor Club, uh, where some of them, came back to the college after they realized during the process of the journey, I need to equip myself and that's when I need some kind of mentor or coaching. That's what these lead innovations or let's say the mentor startup mentor clubs are about. So, so Samita Bhuva from the medical thing has asked, uh, a medical domain has asked, my friend, I think the world is needing for entrepreneurs in this domain. I don't think there would be anybody else who is better placed and advantageous than you guys now, because going back again to the point of Krish, the enormous amount of problems existing today in this domain are unparalleled to any other industry and rather as any other focus also. So if you're able to solve some problem in this, let me tell you, there's a queue of angel investors running around in this domain. I hope that sums up. Uh, it's been long, sorry for that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rao. So I'll hand over to Srinachar to take it from here. Thank you, sir. Uh, my, question to, uh, to, my question is to Mr. Baral. Starting a new business is an exciting undertaking. It's a journey filled with twists and turns, requiring an entrepreneurial mind, mindset and an adventurous spirit. So you've been engaged in uh, accelerating new businesses that are unconventional uh, in your organization, which is Tata Steel. So how do you manage to generate unconventional ideas for, for businesses? And uh, how, how, how would you define which idea is rational and which isn't? Yeah, so first is I, I will not say that I generate ideas. Uh, so what I do is I pick up ideas and I pick up people. So we call them promoters. So like you have promoters in startups. So we call them in Tata still, we call them technical promoters. So anybody who's got an idea, uh, mind you, we're talking of hard technologies here uh, in Tata still. So we're not talking of software and IT uh, and stuff. Uh, so anything that you pick, uh, entails investment. You Even if it's a, just a small pilot, just a lab scale um, facility that you want to put up, it's going to cost not less than, uh, say, uh, a couple of crore rupees in Indian rupees. So uh, it makes, uh, and of course, the, the fail fast uh, uh, terminology also uh, gets extended. So you can't really just uh, fail in six months because just to put up a plant, it say it takes six months and you run it and you and you then actually do a market testing. So it's not less than two years. That's why this question is of a lot more importance, as you said. How do we pick, uh, how do we rationally pick the ones which are going to be successful? And I don't have an answer for that. Because uh, first thing, of course, you see is that, uh, is there a market to what we are seeing? So once the market is there, uh, the next thing is, uh, do, what strengths do we have? Because there are many other players. There must be some other player uh, doing something. So if these two questions are answered, so what I do is I don't bother about the price and the cost and the efficiencies, because if you start bothering about those points uh, at that point in time, you are probably going to kill that idea. So it's that you, a basic screening that is there a market and is there a strength portion that you bring into this. And after that, you just have to back it up. And uh, when you say back it up for hard technologies, you have to back it up for not less than two years. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, sir. Thank uh, you. Uh, 
a follow on question for this would be when you're bringing ideas to the table how do you manage to retain employees and uh, bring their buy in yeah so my answer to this is uh, for any role or any venture that you pick up uh, you need a team all of us know that but not all roles are entrepreneurial so you must identify which roles are entrepreneurial and which roles are not so if you do a mismatch if you pick uh, i mean do a mismatch there then uh, you're going to suffer right uh, but you must pick must be quick to realize that uh, suppose it is not working out for a particular role you must be open in the discussions uh, with that particular uh, individual for that role that uh, see i know that you are good and that's the reason that you have been picked up for this Uh, but now it is not working and probably it's a year in generally in corporates you generally have to wait for a couple of years to actually take a call but in uh, startup kind of uh, uh, ventures in corporates you have to be a little faster not less than a year because again it follows a cycle of one appraisal to another appraisal so you probably can't uh, move within the year but at least within that that year itself you have to take a call you have to explain things and then uh, it's about the individuals as uh, one of my panelists was saying a fellow panelist was saying it's about the individuals it's not about the company at that point thank you sir that was very insightful so mr barrel i want to ask you this thing uh, you have been working with tatas for 11 long years in fact while looking at your profile we were reminded of one club footballers like lionel messi who is associated with uh, barcelona and ryan giggs who is associated with uh, manchester united so could you tell us what's your favorite part uh, working with tatas and how is the conglomerate transitioning under the chairmanship of mr natarajan chandrashekaran anything entrepreneurial so that students could get some learning out of it sir you are on mute i'm sorry so what the two questions in that i think the first one was uh, i staying longer in this company and uh, what does mr chandrashekaran bring in now for this group yes sir right okay um see again it's not about uh, tata steel or say uh, if someone says that i am in love with tata as i am in love with tata steel uh, it's not that uh, what tata steel does is uh, it uh, gives you a lot of opportunities a lot of freedom uh, so and every time you feel that you're maturing in a role uh, the company offers you another challenging opportunity so that's what has uh, but this is where uh, i mean when you took the example of puyol and the ryan gigs uh, of football Uh, they stay for other reasons in the in the in the team uh, because there is not much. I mean, you have they just love that uh, the game is around them, right? They are the center, and you uh, you build a play around them. That's not what happens in corporates. Uh, you should not want to become the center of attention in a corporate. Rather, uh, I would say that you should just creep in. You should I mean get the job that you want, and you just start doing it uh, so so well. Uh, prove it at the background. You just be at the background at the team, be at front. and when you prove it and when you realize that uh, you know i think uh, i can do a little more than this that's when you reach out and uh, you should be open for more risks uh, to be taken within the corporate when i'm saying risk it is not like a startup risk uh, where you lose it all in the corporate you just have to take a little bit of a career risk there so uh, tata steel uh, as a company provides that freedom that leeway uh, to keep changing uh, keep things that interest you that in, uh, that excite you that's why i'm uh, i've been here for that long uh about mr chandrasekhar um see his mantra is consolidation uh because tata as a group had uh, i mean more than 100 companies uh, at one point in time and tata steel itself had around 17 18 companies subsidiary companies uh, so we are all folding them back uh because he he, he understands uh, that uh, to be able to be competitive uh, we must be either number one or number two in that industry and to be able to do that you must consolidate you must bring in so there are many such examples where many of the companies are merging uh, together yet mr chandrasekhar and what he also does is it might seem a little contrary that consolidation and experimentation so he also encourages experimentation he encourages individual companies to try try and look at new things so i'll give an example not many of you would be aware that tata steel is into new materials when i say new materials it is non steel so we're looking we're looking at uh, fiber reinforced plastics we're looking at ceramics and uh, one of the questions was on medical materials we are also getting into medical materials when i'm saying medical materials not the services sector it is rather the uh, the equipments diagnostics the prosthetics wherever there is material involved uh, 
So how is that happening? Because there is a board, there is a chairman uh, who is who encourages, and of course there is a CEO and MD of the Tata of the company of Tata Steel who encourages this. So it's all happening. So one hand it is consolidation, and the other hand uh, companies are being encouraged to take new risks, to do new experiments. And uh, as I said, in in capital intensive industries like steel, anything that you put hands on is not less than hundred crores. Any small plant is going to cost you say hundred, two hundred, three hundred crores minimum. So that's how the, the the credit goes to Mr. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. So my next question is for Mr. Krish. Sir, we often see that uh, entrepreneurs entrepreneurs generally talk about investors. They talk about funding. They also talk about. They're quite optimistic that um, you know their startup or their business, whatever it is, would be successful. And many times, many people don't discuss about exit planning, or they don't even concentrate on it. In fact. so you know they don't they are not aware of they don't even consider the fact that there could be adverse situations so i just want to ask you this do you think it's necessary to have an exit strategy and have you seen uh, anyone in the course of your career going through the same uh, a great question um, generally when you uh, when you start a business uh, it, it it happens because uh, no it is it was triggered by something that happened uh, not to you or to your family uh, you wanted to solve a problem so there's an emotional attachment to uh, the problem that you're solving most of the time uh, an entrepreneur uh, no then then you start building on that idea uh, then you would uh, i've been following the the questions uh, in the in the q and a box uh, uh, how do you know it's a good idea uh, um, uh, or uh, what what is it that you do after you start a business how do you how do you get money how do you get valuations so maybe you know some of what i say now addresses some some of these uh, the questions there's there's nothing called a good idea or a bad idea uh, it is uh, if it is an idea that solves a problem number one uh, and if it is uh, something that a, a customer would embrace uh, a, a user a buyer would embrace uh, then that's what i would focus on so the focus should always uh, shift to the user uh, the consumer uh, uh, many times we think that i have uh, uh, i have i have got this great idea i have built this great product i need money to build my business so that's a very wrong approach uh, you don't know how great a product you you think it's a great product because you're emotionally attached to it Uh, let's ask the the prospective customers if it is a great great product and uh, it'll be amazing what you would learn through that experience if you go talk to uh, 10 people uh, you would hear uh, things you know that would make you change your uh, uh, plan so an, as an entrepreneur uh, i want to be flexible i don't want to be very attached to, to a business idea and when things are not working you should know that you have to quit uh, if, if you are so emotionally invested in that idea many times it's very hard you know even if others say this is not good you don't want to quit so that is you know uh, the I'll, i'll come to your question on exit uh, in a moment but when you should know when to quit uh, you should uh, know pivot to a different uh, 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 solution within the problem domain so when you when you pick uh, an idea uh, focus on the domain rather than on the product uh often times uh, as entrepreneurs you know you focus on a product or a solution as engineers especially i think many of uh, the audience is uh, your engineers your your tendency is to uh, to to engineer something to add features to add you know uh, uh, 10 more features or uh, 20 more features to the product the customer doesn't care he all he may be interested is in one feature not not a you know 100 or 1000 features so you uh, the trick is for you to understand what that one feature is that triggers uh, a success here and you know go after that if you you can't produce that one feature then then change your idea be very flexible so th- that that's very important um uh, in terms of exit now you don't start a business with the uh, uh, no this is how i'm going to exit uh, you focus on uh, the fundamentals of the business uh, is it solving a problem is it solving uh, a specific problem that the customers will embrace uh, uh, and is this uh, a better solution than other solutions that are there in in the market so you want to completely understand uh, the market dynamics of it 
and uh, start building the business around that and exit will follow. Uh, you, you don't start thinking in it's, it's the, in the reverse order. You don't start thinking about exit when you start the, the business. Uh, and it is the individual, the, the tenacity with which you pursue the uh, problem domain that you picked, uh, the external environment that exists uh, around that problem. Those are the factors that you should consider. And as things change, as customer behavior changes, as uh, customer prefer preferences changes, you should be able to uh, adjust your solution to those uh, to those changes. Yeah, thank you, sir. So my next question is open to, to all the panelists. So we have this uh, notion in India that, you know, uh, before pursuing your dream of entrepreneurship, at least after you're graduating, you want to work at some at some corporation or something like that for a couple of years to know how things work, how are various departments in a company work, how are they organized and all that, and then pursue your dream. So I just want to ask this, do you think lack of job prior job experience is an Achilles heel for the college students who want to dive into this? It's an open question, sir. I, I can, I'm happy to, to take a first pass at it. I think um, we've touched on some of these thoughts, I think, uh, earlier, but, um, you know, if you believe in data, <laughs> which, you know, we, we tend to, to convince ourselves that's the way to look, um, data shows us that without some knowledge, right? The thing you cannot replace is knowledge of the arena. And, and I, I, it, domains are interesting term because you can apply something that you learn to many different solutions. I think as, as a Mr. Venkat uh, Rao had, had, had brought up, I mean, you, you, you're not just like applying your domain knowledge to only one solution. Domain knowledge should be applicable across potentially many arenas. Without it, it's the hardest thing to replace or to, to, to find when you're starting a business, right? And so without some key understanding, do you have to get that at work, at a job somewhere? You have to get it. How you get it is really open. Maybe the fastest way to get it is to go work. Uh, just as a quick example, I, I supported a student team who wanted to build a quick service restaurant model across Boston, which has now been in place for about 11 years and been very successful. When they came to me, I said, how many of you have worked inside the quick service restaurant industry? None of them had. I said, I'm not interested in helping you unless you all want, unless you go work in the industry and come back and tell me you still want to do it. They all worked for a year and then came back, right? They built some knowledge that they could now use to make informed decisions about the choices and the things they need to solve. Without that, I, I think it would have been very difficult for them to move forward. Any any industry without something and wherever you get it, it doesn't have to be in a job. It can be, you know, I mean, it's working. You can be a child growing up. Maybe you're a farmer uh, and you've been working with your family's business or there's a wide range of ways to get that information uh, and knowledge. But yeah, you know, it's it's hard to, to just jump in, not impossible, hard to jump in uh, without having some idea or some experience. Thanks for the insight, sir. So Srinija will be taking over now. Yeah, uh, my last question to uh, you is to, I'm sorry, my last question is to Mr. Rao. So uh, we have seen in your profile that you're a sales genius. So what works the best in sales? A product that is consumer friendly or selling a product that has high tech features? It's a client. I think, I think whatever solves the problem of a client is the best thing. I think there is no second thought as for me. I think, I think let me uh, tell one thing over here. I think uh, sales, if I say, I think uh, I, I often recommend people to start a career in sales for some of the reasons, even for one or two years, is that every person, I mean, the entrepreneurs would understand it better. Every person in the company is actually a sales guy. Let's look at it. You're making a phone call and somebody at the reception, the security guard is picking up the phone. He was as brash as possible. He skilled the deal there. So that's, that's a harsh reality. Now he might say that nothing would happen to me, but sorry, it's something would happen when it's, when his uh, boss basically has to shut the shop down, he's also going to get impacted. I think that is something which everybody needs to understand. And when you have this mindset, I mean, again, coming back to the same thing, we let's say any kind of particular function which exists is exist basically because of, I think we in India know it better because if you go to any of the nationalized banks, you see a famous quote of Mahatma Gandhi, which says that the customer at your premises is not a favor, but in fact, he, he's doing a favor by coming to your place. 
I think this has been emphasized as in many times by Croatian is saying, and the client and the customer is a key. If you're solving the issues for him, you're solving the problems for him, and that that really is there. So the tech products, I, I would say the core of a product is the client and rest all are argumented. Yeah, I hope it answers. It does, sir. Thank you. There's another question. So could you please share for our audience some of the best sales strategies that work in a B2C or a B2B uh, businesses? Uh, so, uh, so I, I think because I'm also from an alumni of uh, Geetam, I mean, I really want to take this uh, thing for most of the people who are over there. Uh, before you get onto the sales strategies or whatever it is, I think whatever you're driving, I think self-belief is a critical piece for any particular strategy. And uh, uh, this is this is just a small story. I thought it should be true to you because most of you guys, all of all the guys are here from Geetam. And uh, I have traveled from Geetham to got the campus of IM and then on to Stanford. But let me tell you, I think uh, if you were serious in your class, I still do not see much difference in case, you know, Y is equal to C plus I and cost in economics is business cost plus opportunity cost was normal profit. I think nothing much changed from what Ashok or let's say Madhvi ma'am or SK Press or all these people told to me. But self-belief is something which I believe when I was in Geetham. Uh, the reason why I've been saying that everybody should start a career in sales is you will understand what rejection is all about. Let me tell you guys, you, a sales guy goes on, probably he would two or three people in a day, probably all the guys might even shine him away. I mean, if you go across the globe, I'm telling you, it's not just particular to India. And this was so true. I mean, I'm not demeaning Gitam for a moment over here. Let's understand there was this company who said that, why should we take you? I mean, I've asked them that, why are you not taking me as a management trainee and why are you taking me as an office trainee? The guy said that you're not from an IM. And then I went on to get my degree later, but then they still took me as an I am, uh, I'm in management trainee for a simple perspective. I said that you put me through the rigorous process, though I'm from Gita, and assess me after that particular time. If I really can't crack it, then you take your call. And uh, why did this happen? Let me tell you. I think this is a very small story. There's a guy called Hazel Atkins, and this is for most of the entrepreneurs, so it'll really work. Uh, this guy was basically born in West Virginia, and he was one of the 10 children their parents had. And literally, the only favorite sport he played was kicking the tin on the roads kind of thing. But he had an ear for music and then he used to listen to radio those days. And then, and then he heard a fabulous music and a song and everything with an orchestra. And then he says, and thanks a lot, that's Hank Williams. So this little, little Hazel Atkins thought, he's a guy who played everything. He played the trumpet, he played the drums, he played everything and then, and then he went on. And imagine the power of self-belief here. He believed in that, so he ended up becoming a musician who basically produced a single man orchestrated song by himself and went on to become the popular figure. I'm saying this for the folks over here who are there and especially for the students, the digital natives, as I often call them. All of us here, the panelists are apologize. We are digital immigrants, you know, natives. <laughs> so you guys have the advantage of being the digital immigrants. Maintain this, you know, self-belief. And then if you have a self-belief, I think the sales strategy is GTM with client being at the crux of it. I think whatever you do, keep the client at the crux of it and devise your strategies. I'm sure they will work. So that's, uh, sorry for the long one again, but that's it. Thank you, sir. That was good. So uh, let's move on to the registration Q&A. We have a few questions uh, lined up. Questions lined up, I'm sorry. So. Yeah, the first question is by uh, Sivram Sandhi. Does social entrepreneurship make better, uh, make future for India, future of India for small businesses better? It's, it's open to everyone, so anyone could answer. I, I can take that question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, when you talk of social entrepreneurship, uh, you're essentially uh, solving a societal uh, problem. Uh, in, in the larger sense, almost everything you solve is uh, for the society. Uh, but specifically, I think we, we, the context here is uh, that uh, in India, we, India is um, uh, mostly rural India. Uh, the composition is changing a little bit, but this a large extent of you know, rural India that uh, uh, the the uh, the um, that comprises uh, the Indian um, uh, population. So in in rural India, their access to services uh, is very limited. Access to 
um, things that you you take for granted uh, living in a city or a town are often uh, uh, not out of reach for uh, uh, rural Indians. Uh, so that is, you know, as I, going back to my original uh, statement, uh, where is, where there is a problem, there is an opportunity for an entrepreneur, uh, and uh, India especially is very ripe for for that type of entrepreneurship, solving problems that affect the society directly. And we are already seeing that a number of uh, solutions that come out of, kind of come out of India and the students, uh, especially from uh, rural India, uh, are uh, uh, based on providing solutions to those uh, very problems. Uh, so it, it, th there's a huge opportunity there. And uh, since many students come from there also, uh, uh, the composition-wise, uh, students might have moved to a, a rural, uh, to a, uh, a metropolitan setting for their studies, but uh, their family may still be in India. They have connections back to back to uh, when I say India, rural India, uh, connections uh, back to the rural India. So they have they have seen those, they have observed those uh, uh, problems, uh, and it is uh, ripe for them uh, to come up with solutions to those problems. Uh, and how does it, how does, uh, what makes a social enterprise uh, self-sustainable? Uh, uh, well, you, you have to, in any business, whether you're doing it for the society or uh, for uh, a profit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for, uh, for a business problem that you're solving, you have to be able to make, make money. You, you, you're in, in a, uh, in a not-for-profit, you, you give flow that money back, and you know you do it for development. Uh, but you know you have to always think about uh, providing a solution that uh, generates uh, revenue, generates uh, a profit, and uh, is able to serve a, part a particular cause. Uh, so absolutely yes, uh, and especially in a social enterprise, if uh, you're solving a problem for the society, there's help available. There is, I'm sure, India has uh, a big. Uh, uh, help available uh, through the CSR programs uh, of, of various large corporations. There is uh, governmental help available. There is uh, funding available uh, through multiple sources. Uh, uh, so I would be focused on uh, the, the problem at hand and building a solution for that problem. Thank you, sir. The next question is, is it possible for founders with non-tech backgrounds to create a technology company with their idea? If so, how do we go about it? If, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm happy to take this uh, response. Um, I see this almost every day. I probably talk to, uh, oh, goodness, at least a thousand startup ventures ideas uh, every year. And I see a lot of students who come with an idea of a problem to solve that requires a technical solution. Um, and then they ask me, well, you know, I, here's my idea and I need someone to, uh, can you find a coder for me or can you find an engineer for me or can you find a materials specialist for me? Uh, so you can start a company you don't need the technical background, but you need someone who has it because without Without it, uh, it's very difficult. So, uh, you know, this goes back, maybe we haven't touched on this, but there is no way to start a company by yourself. Uh, entrepreneurship is a team sport. It's, it's in fact, in Northeastern, it's our, our number one team sport. We don't even have an American football team on our campus. So uh, we focus on entrepreneurship and it's about getting to know people, know your skill sets, know what skill sets you need that you don't have, and then build a team that can fill out all of the skills that you need, right? Uh, when you're trying to start something. So if you don't have a technical background, but you have an idea of the market, find someone who has the technical skills that you need or access to those. Um, so you can do it, yes. In fact, we see a lot of companies that, that have founders that are not technical founders, but they built a team that has the right resources and skills to do it. So if you haven't started to think about team building, and I, I haven't talked to a lot of uh, the student teams there in, in India, and you, you, tend to you tend to have a team that all looks just like you. They're all engineers, they're all computer science folks, and there's not a diversity of talent. 
on the teams that you're starting to try to explore your ideas with. So rethink that a little bit. Think about building teams of diverse backgrounds that can help you uh, fill all the requirements of the skills you need uh, as you're starting to, to pursue your idea. I guess so, that was good. The next question is, how to start up a business without any major big financial background? And what are the aspects of finance should student entrepreneurs worry about? Okay. Uh, oh, to hear this from Krish. If yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm happy to answer this. Uh, um, you don't. I think this this question gets asked so often uh, whenever I address students. Uh, uh, after my um, after my talk, uh, I see at least uh, you know a dozen, couple dozen students you know, come to me and ask. You know, I have this great idea. I want to, but I'm, I'm I come from a middle class family. I don't have the finances. But how can I? How can I proceed? Uh, so do you need money to start a business? Uh, 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 when you ask this question, when I ask this question to a gathering, uh, you know, I get an overwhelming response. Yes, we need money to uh, start a business. My answer is uh, no, you don't need money to start a business. Uh, there's plenty of money available uh, if you have uh, a, a, a very good venture uh, to begin with. So if you have an idea, I would build on that idea. I would get it to a stage where I'm able to showcase it either uh, through a prototype or through uh, talking uh, or uh, through some sketches, or through a, even through a simple PowerPoint presentation, uh, you, you're able to convince a set of investors that you, know, you have uh, this great solution to this great problem uh, and the money will, money will uh, follow. Uh, especially in India, uh, I've noticed that there's plenty of money, plenty of investors. I'm part of an angel investment group uh, every month, uh, we uh, we invite uh, uh, ventures to come and pitch to us, uh, uh, and then if we're convinced, uh, we we end up uh, funding those uh, uh, those businesses, and we get plenty of uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, founders coming and pitching to us. Uh, we, uh, in fact, they go through a rigorous uh, screening process, uh, but no, we're not finding enough businesses to invest in. We we have open checkbooks. We don't have enough businesses to, uh, 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 to to finance. So I would focus on the problem. I would focus on uh, uh, finding solutions, uh, telling stories. Uh, uh, if you're able to uh, tell a good story, I'm sure there are uh, people with checkbooks uh, that will follow you. Thanks, Krishan. And for everybody's comes up, just to add, uh, while Krish has covered everything, there are accelerated programs which are run by corporates like PV. So, so there are accelerated programs which basically incubate uh, some of the greatest ideas and run it. It's everywhere. It's available across all the things. And I also want to endorse that point. And even I have been to one of the uh, angel investor meeting. Uh, as he said, many angel investors were ready with blank check books, but sadly there were not many ideas which were able to save them. So don't get worried if there is just a great idea there. Thanks. I think this question is for me, Srinja. Yes, yes, sir. What it says. Uh, In these pressing times, I'm sorry, please continue. Yeah, what would aspiring entrepreneurs can expect to face in the FMCG industry? Uh, guys, from an FMCG perspective, let me tell you, I think this is one industry which is uh, not very turbulent. Uh, I mean, you might not get a, a, you know, multiple kind of, uh, what do you call it? I mean, disruption, which is visible from a sheer uh, go-to-market or product perspective, but innovation exists there. One of the things what happens in FMCG, what I would have uh, you know, uh, found is uh, it's more like a brick and mortar kind of steady state business without much crusts and troughs. So, and uh, what biggest challenges, if you ask me, how do we bring in the age old best practice of, of FMCG in this tech domain world? I think that's called the biggest challenges. Like the, the companies of Hindustan Lever understands very well, Unilever understand very well, uh, how do they need to manage wholesale and retail and make both of them coexist? 
but integrating this with the tech piece is is what is really different and one of the biggest things which is coming up in fmcg off late which is a you know nomenclature which is used predominantly in tech which is called as user experience mind you guys this is hitting in a big time in in fmcg so people really want to know why would uh, let's say the i'm i'm taking the example of begum bazaar why would the zarina begum of uh, you know begum bazaar go there and spend some 10 rupees on a lux soap and not buy a particular advertisement of a particular you know celebrity is given there so i think this user experience i mean apple has this user advisory both both the tech companies has this you'll be surprised some of the fmcg is starting this user experience i think if that's uh, again coming back to the same thing if somebody wants to understand what problem you want to solve if you can solve the user experience problem of fmcg in rural i think we are we are basically tackling the biggest challenge over there All right. Uh, so we have a lot of overwhelming responses. Uh, questions actually coming from a lot of audience. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of a time with uh, uh, four amazing panelists. But uh, I think we have time for one quick, one last question, and this question is directed to Mr. Subrath. Uh, it's a live uh, Q and A, uh, like a question that has come uh, on the chat. The question is from Sri Ram C A. Uh, the question says, "Why agripreneurs are not very successful in our compare uh, in our country compared to IT based startups?" and what kind of ecosystem uh, universities need to build uh, to sustain these kind of innovations i think that's the last question we'll take for today and after that we'll move to what of thanks thank you so uh, yeah so uh, i'll attempt to answer this i'm sure uh, krish and uh, mr rao and uh, others will be more qualified to answer this uh, so this is my take on agriculture uh, so agriculture sector doesn't have enough money so when you compare that with uh, services sector we talking of uh, e-commerce we talking of uh, i mean everything is directed to the urban middle class uh, yeah, and uh, this is a mobile uh, group which is up and coming which has money uh, but that sector uh, we talking of small farmers subsistent uh, farming so the money is not there i mean um, i mean the the core work has to happen there how do you create money in the hands of farmers and uh, uh, that's when uh, startups who have great ideas who have radical ideas to really uh, innovate in the agriculture so that's where then money starts flowing to them uh, to me, to me uh, that's a big problem but nonetheless you can still choose pick and choose which areas to work on so one of the areas where uh, probably i think where uh we can still make a difference in india is still lagging behind is the supply chain on the agriculture front uh, so uh, that's an area where you need not invest heavily on technology but you can say work out more efficient ways uh, and the startups can also be successful and there are quite a few startups who are successful on that front yeah i would rather now want uh, some of your panelists so to maybe add to this yeah, a quick quick note there um, uh, yes unfortunately um, Uh, there's not much money there uh, you look after you go after uh, sectors you uh, know that have quick uh, that give you quick returns uh, but but i my take would be this 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 probably i would turn the question back around uh, to you the audiences uh, uh, you you many of you come from uh, rural areas uh, or you have family or extended family that have connections to the rural areas you've seen the problems uh, you live those problems uh, uh, the, that the farmers face uh, that the agriculture sector faces you've gotten an education in technology uh, many of you uh, or other fields now go back and apply uh, what you've learned uh, in uh, in through your te- technological education back to solving those problems this is a huge opportunity for you uh, there, there, there is uh, there's plenty of once you start applying the technology back to a, a a problem area like agriculture uh, you will come up with solutions and if uh, you know you showcase those solutions to uh, to investors i'm sure investors are willing to uh, bet on you so it's up to you to take this up as a as a, a challenge i would almost throw this as a challenge to you uh, apply your the learnings that you have from your uh, college to solving uh, some of those problems that uh, create a huge impact and in the process you can make money i'm not saying don't make money uh, as a businessman as a as, as an entrepreneur uh, your goal should be to make money don't shy away from that also also real quick um agtech is a fast growing investment arena 
Uh, I work with uh, a lot of uh, accelerators around the world. Uh, the Middle East, believe it or not, is spending a lot of money in ag tech right now. Um, I think the way to think about it is what's the way you can increase yields, increase quality, um, and, and improve, I think, to, the, to uh, Mr. Uh, Subrat's point, in, increase access or supply uh, and, and make that a more efficient process. And, and on, as, you, as you combine those factors, there is significant, significant, huge opportunity. I love to be in a business where there's demand. And, uh, you know, there's demand for food every day. So I think, uh, I think we have to think about the problems that are facing that space and uh, really get excited about serving the population with something we all need, right? Uh, in a much more efficient, much better improved quality way. Food quality, food health uh, has so many issues right now. It doesn't matter which country you live in. And so solving those problems can be tremendously beneficial. Uh, and uh, as, as we've noted, if you do it properly, you know, money isn't always the primary driver. We need to make enough money to reinvest and, and to, uh, to, to keep uh, and continue growing. But, uh, you know, if we can solve some social issues at the same time, what a wonderful way to, to uh, uh, become a, a really uh, impressive entrepreneur. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Subrat, Krish, and Greg, uh, for wonderful insights on ag tech sector. Ag tech is, again, like, you know, uh, since I'm personally associated with Geetha, when we uh, uh, engage with a lot of students, ag tech is something that keeps coming up. Uh, so thank you so much. And we have at least another three dozen questions that the audience are asking. Some of these questions are already answered. Uh, throughout the session, some of the questions are not. So what we'll do is uh, we will uh, we will uh, we will try our level best to reply uh, back to your questions uh, uh, over an email. Uh, so that's all from our side for this event, and we'll uh, wish all on to you with a word of thanks. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. So it's really sad that uh, we have to come to the end of the frame. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end, and the same goes with this panel as well. I thank Mr. Rao, Mr. Burrell, Professor Collier, and Mr. Krish for taking time off the hectic schedules and being with us today and briefing us about all the ethos and all the essentials that one needs to know before aspiring to be an entrepreneur. And I'm sure of it that when the time comes, many of the participants here will put what they have learned today to good use. And according to us, the best way to do so is by registering up for Smart Ideathon 2021. So Smart Idea Thon is, as the name states, is a business idea competition conducted by VDC and sponsored by Northeastern University's Center of Entrepreneurship Education and Thai Andhra Pradesh. The link is in the chat box. And also you can visit our website, vdc.geetham.edu to know more about it. I would also like to thank all my colleagues from eClub community and the coaches associated with VDC for putting their heart and soul into this event and for making it a success. Special thanks to our central marketing team of Geetham as well from, for promoting the event online and giving it the much needed boost. And last but not least, stay home, stay safe, and enjoy your journey of learning. Because Warren Buffett once said, the more you learn, the more you earn. This is Vishal and Srinija signing off for now. Have a lovely weekend ahead. Thank you.